Plastics are everywhere. You've probably heard that before, possibly even for me. I mean, I did just say it three seconds ago. <laughs> so there's a good chance you may have heard it from me, but I assure you, I was not lying. The good people at TEDx have made sure that I brought my own data to back me up. <laughs> yeah, data on a screen behind me. Yeah, I know, I know. It's a bit of an obscure reference and you know, TEDx insisted that I do it and that's the only reason it's here today. I tried to protest saying, well, you know what? Something this obscure could be alienating to my audience. But they said, don't worry, he's an android. <laughs> All right, we're getting a little too deep here. But the real data on plastics is actually pretty striking. Because everywhere we've looked, we have found evidence of humanity's synthetic existence. On the tops of the tallest mountains, plastics. Depths of the deepest seas, plastics. Snowfall in Antarctica, plastics. Remote islands, plastics. Inside your butthole. <laughs> yeah. When I said plastics are everywhere, you might not have thought I meant everywhere, everywhere. And of course, by butthole, what I mean is plastics have been found in human fecal matter. They've also been found in the bloodstream. They've been found in the lungs. They've been found in the placenta. And there's even data to suggest they could be in your brain. Yeah, no place is safe. Not even your butthole. Boom! I did it. With this sentence, I've now said butthole four times. This is a new TEDx world record you're witnessing right now. Right. Whew, back to plastics. As a researcher at the University of Auckland, I look for microplastics in the environment. Turns out, not that hard to find. Because, well, they're everywhere, and a big reason why is us humans love them. And our love for them is growing exponentially. We are on pace to more than triple the amount of plastics on this planet by 2050. Meanwhile, things like the global birth rate are actually declining. So from this, you might gather that we're loving plastics more than we're loving each other. <laughs> However, <laughs> there are some researchers that think that these two trends could be related. But more on that later. Now you might think with all this plastic pollution, surely we can just recycle it away, right? Well, unfortunately, less than 10% of all plastic that has ever been created has been recycled. Less than 10%. So that means a lot of it is gonna just go into the environment where it can break down into tiny, microscopic pieces and travel across the globe. Even to small countries in the middle of the Pacific that are so remote, they often get left off the map. <laughs> Here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, plastics have arrived and they're actually falling from the sky. Here in Auckland, when it rains, it's literally raining down plastic. Pretty grim, huh? When my research team actually made this observation, I'm not gonna lie, it was pretty cool to see all the plastics in our sample until we realized what that actually meant. There's a weird mix of emotions that I highly recommend slash hope you never experience. Because with the plastics in the atmosphere, that means we are very likely breathing them in. Take the air in this theater, for instance. Seems pretty clean, right? No smoke, no haze, no dust. Visually, you can see everything happening here. If I were to do one of these, you would notice. Not because of my undeniable skills, but clean air means clear visibility. So go ahead, take a deep breath. Enjoy that you may have just breathed in a microplastic. <laughs> yes. How do I know? 
because I tested the air in this very theater before you came in. <laughs> that is right. I did some microplastic analysis on the tiny particles floating in this exact theater. Now, before I get into the results, does anybody want to know how I did this observation? Yeah, well, for those who said no, too bad, you don't have a choice. <laughs> that was a rhetorical question. So what I did is I tried to collect all the particles in the air onto a filter. Similar concept to if you had a coffee filter, but instead of looking for ground up coffee beans, I captured all the little tiny aerosol particles in the air. And once I got this filter, I then took it into the lab and got really nerdy with it. <laughs> like, big time. Prepare yourselves. This technique I used is called pyrolysis gas chromatography mass spectrometry. <sighs> okay, those are a lot of big words, but it's actually a pretty simple concept. I took my plastics and I heated them up just to watch them melt to their death like the sick, sad scientist I am. <laughs> Basically, how it works is I can take these plastic polymers, heat them up, and they'll form a very unique chemical signature in the gas phase. So just by monitoring the gases that are formed when I do this pyrolysis, I can then tell exactly which polymers they originated from. This, of course, is not the only way to detect microplastics. But it is my personal favorite because, well, it's a great technique. You can measure all the plastics at once, there's less restrictions by size, has great limits of detection, and my personal favorite gives you a plethora of chemical information. And as an analytical chemist, I love chemical information. <laughs> I'm serious. Like, Pour it over me right now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I can get a little carried away when it comes to chemistry. Whew, what were we talking about? Ah, yes, plastics in the air right now. So when I did this analysis, I found three different polymers in the air of this theater. I found polyester, nylon, and PVC. So disclaimer. This has not been peer reviewed, okay? So just think of this as preliminary data. That being said, really wouldn't be surprising to see these indoors. Polyester and nylon are used to make things like carpeting and clothing, whereas PVC is a common building material. I also did this analysis at a lower temperature where I could actually see some of the chemicals and plastic additives in the polymers themselves. And here's where I saw a phthalate compound which of course I'll be talking a little bit about later. So when it comes to plastic pollution, if a particle is small enough, and I'm talking on the scale of nanometers, you can inhale it, it can get into your bloodstream, it can travel across the old body, and it can even enter organs. So the highest risk particles aren't what we would call microplastics, but what we term nanoplastics. And having these nanoplastics going around your body, yeah, that doesn't sound great, but there's something a little bit more concerning, and that are the plastic additives, these chemicals that can come along for the ride. So basically, any plastic product is gonna have a unique chemical formulation to give it certain properties. It's why an IV bag is soft and flexible, but a food container might be hard and brittle, even though they could be made from the same polymer. Different chemical additives to give it different physical properties. And it turns out some of these chemical additives might not be that cool to your insides. Things like BPA and phthalates, which woo, we could be breathing right now, could interact uh, and mimic hormones interacting with the signaling systems of your body. So hormone-related glands like the ovaries and the testes would be of the biggest concern, meaning that there is a good reason to actually investigate this declining birth rate. Of course, we don't have any definitive proof or for causation at this point between these two trends, but it is something that we need to continue looking at, and exposure to airborne microplastics and nanoplastics is the next big thing to look at. 
And these complex chemical formulations are actually a reason why plastics can be so hard to recycle. Each plastic product can be so chemically different that it's usually, well, way easier and importantly, way cheaper to just start from scratch with uh, virgin polymer material rather than trying to repurpose some old plastic that's old and dirty that might not have the formulation you need. On top of that, plastics are usually downgraded in quality every time they're recycled, making it harder to have a truly circular recycling scheme. Knowing this, it may not be too much of a surprise then that just most places can't recycle the plastics they are dealing with. Here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, we can only recycle plastic numbers one, two, and five. And so just having this plastic recycling number on it may not surprise you, but it doesn't mean that it can actually be recycled. And if you do find this a bit surprising, you're not alone. Because it turns out a lot of recent reports have been able to identify that the plastics industry has been spending millions of dollars to try to convince us all that our plastic waste actually has great value, even if they themselves have not been convinced. A report from 2020 by NPR actually identified some leaked documents from 1974 in which a plastic industry insider was quoted as saying, I have serious doubts that it can ever be made viable on an economic basis. Um, apologies to any plastic moguls. In my head, I thought that that's what you might sound like. But coming out, I don't think anyone sounds like that. So apologies. But this issue from 50 years ago is still something we're struggling with today. So with the high costs associated with recycling, there have been a lot of alternatives proposed, things that might be biodegradable or bioplastics. And while moving from petroleum-based plastics to something that you can grow and regenerate is a noble idea, there have been critics to point out things like impacts on climate change due to land use change, as well as the energy efficiency of these processes, and of course, scalability. Additionally, things that are marketed to be biodegradable or oxodegradable actually aren't that much in, in practice. In fact, here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, the Ministry for the Environment currently does not recommend the use of compostable materials as a first option due to issues with sorting and the need for specialized composting facilities along with the chemical additives involved as well as still the production of waste. Now, that's not to say that we shouldn't be researching these alternatives, we absolutely should, but currently, right now, there isn't something out there that can save us, so we should not be relying on technology alone to do so. And of course, none of these alternatives are addressing the real big problem. Our plastic production is currently far outpacing any of our waste solutions. And it is significantly cheaper to prevent plastic pollution than it is to remediate it. When it comes to recycling, we do need a circular scheme where a plastic product that's used can get re returned into a new product that has similar value. But currently, only 2% of recycling is done in this way. I won't dwell too much on the circular economy because that's just a whole nother talk in general. But if you are curious, head into the YouTubes, type it in, and you may find one or two TEDx talks on that very subject. Maybe. The key point from all of this is that there is no silver bullet that is going to solve the plastics problem. We need a multi-pronged approach to address this complex issue, and it's going to take smart government policy to help us. When rolled out judiciously, policies like plastic bans and deposit schemes can limit the amount of waste. However, they are expensive and they can be difficult to enforce. So there have been calls for the industries responsible for plastic pollution to help with mitigation. Currently, the biggest plastic polluters have the resources to help, but they don't have the motivation. And that needs to change if we seriously want to address this issue, 
because we need everybody working together. Industry, governments, consumers alike, all on the same page. It's not fair to sell the idea that, hey, if we just recycled more, this problem would go away. It's much bigger than that. Yes, we do need to recycle, but it needs to be improved, and it needs to increase with production of our waste. We also need to reduce the amount of virgin materials produced, develop more reusable schemes, repurpose the plastic we have, rethink the issues so we can redesign our products. It may be difficult, but if we start making real change, we can improve the future. Because if you think we have a plastics problem now, the situation could get a whole lot worse if we don't listen to our data. Kia ora. <laughs>